You may be seated, Cove Church. Thank you for being here tonight, and thank you for joining us in, in worship. Um, have you all been to an Ash Wednesday service before? Yeah? Okay. Some new folks, maybe, too, to Ash Wednesday. Um, maybe you just looked it up online and said, is there a church in town doing an Ash Wednesday, and you shut up. If you're a guest um, and you're trying us out tonight, um, because we had an Ash Wednesday service, I've Thank you for being here. I'm glad about it. I'm going to grab a chair here. Um, you know, I had planned to kind of do a, a more kind of traditional pulpit style message, but the Lord changed plans on me last minute, as he can sometimes do, and so I'm just going to, I'm going to go a little bit more informal and, and sit down like you guys tonight. My name's Winston. Uh, I'm the music director here, so I usually hide behind the safety of a piano or a, or a guitar or something, so... Um, I am, but I'm here. I am, and um, and that's. I guess that's a little bit about what Ash Wednesday is about. It's just saying, here I am, Lord. This is all I've got. I'm dust. Uh, but you know, hopefully the Lord can do something with that. Um, yeah. So also tonight's Saint Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day to y'all. It's kind of a fun, different way to spend your Valentine's Day. I'm glad you're here, though. Um, you know, it's an interesting contrast, Ash Wednesday and Valentine's Day, right? <laughs> you know, Ash Wednesday is, it's kind of about um, recognizing sin and our own mortality and the brevity of life and really getting serious. And it's like, you know, it uses ash as this sort of vivid image of that. And then you've got cupids and heart-shaped boxes and... <laughs> pink and <laughs> things like that um, for Valentine's Day. So, you know, good on you for showing up and trying out something new for Valentine's Day. I'm, I'm glad you're here. Um, yeah, you know, and actually th there's, there's kind of a fun little connection between uh, St. Valentine, that is, and, uh, and Ash Wednesday. I don't know if I'm going to get into that tonight. If I remember, I will. And if I don't remember and you're curious, grab me afterwards and we can talk about it. Um, but yeah, so... You know, that passage at the beginning that we all read, pretty serious passage, it's traditionally read on Ash Wednesday. Uh, it's kind of from the beginning of this kind of service, which people have been doing Ash Wednesday services since I don't, the sixth century or something like that, a long time. Um, they've been using that passage, and it, it's, it's a calling. You know, it's the prophet Joel calling Israel back, and it, it really speaks of what, what this day is all about. It's calling us back to the Lord. Um, it does so in a pretty serious, almost bone-chilling way. But you know, um, Ash Wednesday and Lent, it doesn't necessarily need to be all doom and gloom, really. You know, it's, it was the uh, theologian uh, Alex, Alexander Schmemann who described Lent as the bright sadness. The bright sadness. You know, I was, I was kind of stewing on that idea this morning. I was like, bright sadness, bright sadness. What is that feeling like? Can I identify with that? Have I ever felt a bright sadness? And this, this is the best I could come up with. Maybe you can connect with it. But um, imagine like a distant time, the 1980s. <laughs> and, and what it was like maybe to be a parent in the 1980s, to have a kid and, you know, kid sports, you know, playing soccer or football or something. I, you know, I'm not an expert on the 1980s. I only spent six years there. And then I was whisked off to the wonderful 90s. But uh, the 1980s, so imagine this time you're, you're a, a parent of a child uh, who's playing football or soccer. And remember, the 1980s, it was a time before participation trophies and, you know, uh, you know self-esteem uh, emphasis on things like that. It was, you know, if you were in football, it doesn't matter if you were in the NFL or you were seven years old, it's like there were winners and there were losers, right? There were, you know, you, you showed up, you did your best and maybe you won, but you know, the victors went home with the spoils and <laughs> the losers went home with maybe a lesson learned, maybe their heads hanging a little low, but the opportunity to try again. And so I think, I think, you know, if you can imagine yourself, you're, you're a parent of a child in the 1980s, they've gone and maybe they just played a really important soccer game and, and they really put it all out there on the field, but it wasn't enough. 
Maybe did their best. Maybe they didn't even do their best. Maybe, you know, they missed a couple of really important shots or something. You're driving your kid home, and they're sad. They're not talking. They've just got their head kind of against the window. They're looking out, and maybe it's raining to make it more dramatic. Um, and you look into the rearview mirror. You look at your kid, and, you, you know, a bright sadness comes over you because <laughs> you're sad because, you know, you wanted them to win, right? You wanted them to win. You wanted them to be champions. But there's something to be learned here too, right? Like, maybe it's good that your kid didn't go home with a trophy that day because maybe they'll go back and say, hey, not this year, but maybe next. You know, and after they've kind of got it all out and, you know, work through their disappointment, they get up the next day and they're working on their footwork with the ball, shooting for next year, the next championship. Maybe they'll take the trophy home next year. It's that courage to kind of say, you know, I'm going to pick myself up and try again. I think that's the best I could come up with. That is the bright sadness of Lent. It's, it's this time of year that we we stare down our sin and our shortcomings and the fact that, you know, we're, maybe we're not carrying many trophies around with us. But there is a prize to be won. And Lent is that opportunity to pick ourselves back up and say, I'm going to try again. And maybe this year will be better than last. You know, the beauty of that is, is that we're not on all our own. It's not all on our own ability to play football or soccer. We have Jesus. Uh, and, you know, it's really Jesus that, that makes it all possible. And so, you know, the words of that song we just sung, nothing, uh, what can wash away my sin? Nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. So we're going to talk a lot about what it is to kind of lean into something like Lent and to pick ourselves back up and, and face our sin and face the world. Uh, but I just want you to always hold that in the back of your mind, that it's nothing but the blood of Jesus that makes that possible. So uh, our passage tonight is John 9. So if you have a Bible, you can uh, turn there to John 9. Um, I didn't really plan on how this was going to work <laughs> with my Bible and my knee and all that. We'll see. Um, I'm going to read uh, John 9, 1 through 7, and then we're just going to go through it verse by verse, okay? And uh, I'm going to, oh, he's done this before. This is not his first rodeo. Okay. Um, John, I'll, I'll just read it for you. Uh, we don't have slides, so, you know, read your Bible or just kind of let the words wash over you. Uh, John chapter 9. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and he made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. So, I really, you know, this passage was just kind of dropped on my lap and I, I really felt like this was our message for Lent this year. This isn't even one of those traditional passages that gets read um, on Ash Wednesday, but I just felt like it was today. And, and as I gone it, through it, I'm going to hopefully go through some of that with you tonight. It just it revealed more and more to me, I think, of what Lent is in terms of the heart of Jesus to heal us, to work in our lives, to bring about his works. Um, and so, you know, when we look at this first verse, um, or three verses, that is, uh, he's walking along. They see a blind man. 
And, you know, in that day, it, to be blind, you know, the, the idea was surely somebody had sinned, right? And so their question is, what caused this man's blindness? Was it his own sin? However, he could do that from birth. Um, or was it his parents? Like, is it his fault, or did somebody up screw up and do that to him? And Jesus shows that he, he's not really interested in that question. He gives them a different answer. But what's funny is, is we ask this question all the time, and even if we're kind of in the scientific age where we can say, oh, you know, you've got this tragic thing in your life like blindness, that's not, you know, your sin or anything. That is, you know, cause and effect, you know, something happened, a birth defect or something happened. Um, that isn't necessarily anybody's fault. Now, we know that with science, but it, it doesn't take much for us to go to where the disciples go, right? Because we, it, does, it, it only takes like a couple of bad things a ro in a row to happen in our life before we start going, well, hey, what's going on here? Is this a cosmic conspiracy? You know, did I mess up? Is God turning his back on me? Is the favor of God gone out of my life? Karma, is karma coming out to get me? You know, people ask things like that. Or, you know, we, we have a, a tendency to point the finger when, you know, somebody does something to us or, you know, we're frustrated at work or something and we're looking for somebody to blame. Why am I feeling this way? Oh, it must be so-and-so's fault down the, you know, down the hall. You know, and even when it's something, you know, very clear, like, you know, well, maybe this is clearly my fault that something has happened. We can oftentimes get in, in the tendency of pointing the finger, pointing the finger at myself. Now, it's important to recognize, you know, sin when we have it and bear, you know, the responsibility to be able to learn and say, hey, I, I did that. Now I know. You know, Lord, help me to be better. But I think this passage is something that Jesus doesn't want us to fixate on pointing the finger. He has something much more beautiful and much more interesting to talk about, honestly. What does he say? He says, it was not that this man or his parents sinned, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. What an interesting thing to say. You know, and when I read that, you know, and I've, and I've read this passage before a number of times in my life, it almost sound, sounds like what he's saying is that, you know, did, did God make him blind just to kind of reveal the works of God? And I think, well, that sounds, I don't know how I feel about that. Does God strike people blind just to kind of show up and be like, hey, look, here I am? You know, I, I don't know that that's what it's saying. And, and there's a clue in that I found actually in Psalm 51, which we sang a bit tonight. Psalm 51, creating me a clean heart. That, that Psalm, there's a part in that Psalm where David says, against you, you only have I sinned and done evil in your sight. And then he says this curious thing. He says, so that you might be justified when you speak and be clear when you pass judgment. Okay, so he uses the same words that Jesus does, so that this might happen. But we know the story of David, right? He didn't go out and sin by sleeping with Bathsheba and then killing her husband. He didn't do that in order to show that, man, God was right about me, right? That's not the story. It's not that that was the cause. What David is saying in the words, so that, so that you might be justified, is he saying that in terms of that is the result, that is the outcome now, right? That this would then happen, that this would be the outcome. And so honestly, I think that is what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, I'm not, I'm not interested so much or as much as you guys are in who did it and who did what in pointing the finger. What I'm interested in is what God can do with that. Yes, this man's blind. But now this is an opportunity to see God do his work here. 
And so that, that's the first lesson I learned here is I think Jesus sees our brokenness as an opportunity for the works of God to be revealed. Now, I hope you all believe that already, but there's, there's an invitation here to have a, a change in our posture towards our sin, right? We could come and show up to Ash Wednesday and, and think about sin and just kind of go, oh, yep, I'm, one, I'm probably the worst one here, you know, and be pointing the finger. Or we could say, yeah, I'm, I'm a simple guy, but Lord, would you do something with that? Would you take that? and turn it into an opportunity for your works to be revealed in me. We all got stuff. We all got stuff in our lives, right? Um, and so part of Ash Wednesday is, is, you know, looking within, doing that bit of soul searching to identify what are those things? What are those things that uh, keep me from trusting Jesus? the things that keep me from following Jesus and, and becoming more like him. I mean, if, if you're going to have a treatment, you need a diagnosis, right? You need to look in and, and you need to see it and identify it. And that's what the Holy Spirit's role is to do, is to reveal those things in us so that we can then be purified, made clean. But the shift inside needs to be one of a bright sadness. It needs to say, I know it's Jesus that can do something about it. I'm dust. I'm probably can't do anything about this on my own, but Jesus can. As we move along in the passage, um, he says this, this is verse four. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And so there's a couple of lessons in here uh, that are really important, I think. The first thing Jesus says here is we. We must work. Right? So he could have said, I must do the things God sent me to do, and I'm going to do them, you know? To an extent, he's saying that, but he's got his disciples there, and he's saying, this isn't a solo act. We, we must do these things. We must work. That is an invitation to every one of us to acknowledge that while nothing can wash away our sin, but the blood of Jesus, the washing away is, is a process that we are invited into. It's not a circumvention of our free will or, or our autonomy as people. It is, it is the Holy Spirit descending in our hearts and giving us the, the power to step into God's process of cleansing and healing. It's a we kind of thing. We must work. This, it, it's a tricky dichotomy, right? God does it, but we're also part of it, right? And, you know, uh, Christians have been arguing over, like, how does that work uh, for centuries, long time? Um, and so I'm not going to propose any solutions other than that is the sort of mystery that w we get to step into. Um, th there's a cool picture of this. Uh, the Cove Church staff went up to Mount Angel Abbey this last week for a retreat. Has anybody been up there, Mount Angel Abbey? Beautiful, amazing place, right? If you're an Oregonian and you haven't been there, shame on you. Go, go. It is beautiful. It is beautiful. It's a Benedictine Abbey just outside of Salem, overlooking vineyards. It's, it's on this, perched on this hill. And uh, it's quite serene until about 5.20 a.m., when the bells of the abbey start ringing, right? And so we're, we stayed here overnight, right? We're staying in these kind of guest house, and 5.20 a.m. sharp, the bells go ding, 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 and they're not like gentle bells. They're, the bells were made to get you out of bed. That is the point of the bell, right? And so what happens is 5.20 a.m., 
all the monks, there's about 46 monks, there's a bunch of seminary students and all the other people that are staying at the abbey, they climb out of bed at 5.20 a.m. and they make their way into the church to begin the cycle of services known as the daily office. Okay? And there's seven of them every day. And that whole thing, the, all the services and all the prayers and the hymns that are sung and the, the pattern of doing it day in, day out, is called the liturgy. And uh, what is that word we've used it around here? It's called, it's been translated uh, in different places as the work of the people. And it's, it is a trans, it's not the best translation. As I looked into what the word liturgy means, it's actually kind of more intended to communicate not that, hey, this is the work we do. It's the work of the people. God does this stuff. We do this part. And that's not what it's saying. It's, it's the work for the people or on behalf of the people, like a public works, right? So what's a public works? Like eWeb, it's the <laughs> doing it for our community, right? Um, eWeb is a public work. They do that for everybody, right? So liturgy in the same way is, is something that is done on behalf of the people, but we participate in it. It's something we enter into. And so when the monks gather together at 5.20 a.m. to begin their first of seven services, they're doing the liturgy. They're entering into something that is, that is God's work on our behalf. They're singing psalms. They're praying for the world and for themselves. They do this day in and day out. It's the work that they do. Like this is their nine-to-five job is doing that. It's their work, but it's God's work that they're being invited into. It's a, cool, it's a cool picture. And in the same way, our lives are a liturgy. It's, it's something that God does in us, but we participate in it. We gotta get out of bed at 5.20 a.m., show up for it, right? So, the bells are ringing in our lives every day. And we can show up and we can participate in that liturgy or we can do our own thing, right? So that's, that's the first part of this, this verse is that it's not a solo act. The other part of this is really important is that this is, there's an urgency to it, right? Jesus says we must do the works of God while it is day. Night comes when no one can work. And, you know, I presume lights out means you're dead, right? While you're alive, it's time to work. Let's get at it, right? And he says, I am the light of the world. And so he's the one and shows up, giving us the light and the ability to see what we were called to do. So, that sense of urgency is, has been a part of what Ash Wednesday has been about for centuries. It's, it's the sense of you look at your life and I, I'm, honestly, I don't have a ton of time. I better get after it, right? James, the apostle says, what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. I, that just was kind of poetry to me until I hit 30s, and I realized, oh, man, he's right. You know, when I was a kid, like, days felt like weeks. Weeks felt like years. Time just kind of stretched on forever. 20s kind of started to change, but, man, by the time I got to my 30s, I was, like, lying down for a nap, and then a year was gone. You blink your eye, and it's like a week. Like, where is the time going? Holy moly, right? Um, there's this bug called the mayfly. Any, anybody ever heard of this bug, the mayfly? Pastor Aaron Wood, he fishes. Um, the, you've probably heard of this, this bug. It, it has this life cycle. It starts out as an egg, but then, like, it reaches adulthood, and it reaches the point that it's now finally getting a chance to do what it was made to do, right? Which is kind of fly away, find a mate, reproduce, make some eggs, 
buy a house, settle down, you know, retire, you know, live off social security, and then finally, you know, go to, go to sleep. But the mayfly, the poor thing, only gets 24 hours to get all that done. It lives one day, and then its life is over. If you're a mayfly, you're not wasting any time, right? You, you emerge out of your cocoon or whatever it is, and you're like, all right, I got to get on it, right? Whoever is making the, like, the dating app for the mayfly is sitting on a gold mine because 24 hours and you found your mate. And you, I told myself I wasn't going to use that joke. But I couldn't resist. Um, okay. So the, we live a little bit longer than a mayfly, right? But not by much. Psalm 90, I'm going to turn to it here. It's got an amazing picture for us. The days of our life are 70 years or perhaps 80 if we are strong. That's true. Um, and I had a, a monk tell me this last week that my life is half over because I'm 39. And nobody had said that to me before. I was like, it's half over. Um, even, so even then, uh, so he's talking about our years. Even then, their span is only toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger? Your wrath is as great as the fear that is due to you. So teach us to count our days that we may gain a wise heart. Part of Ash Wednesday is we learn to count our days. There's a sense of urgency that God is calling us to. He's saying there's work to be done. The bells are ringing. And you're not going to have a whole lot of time. So when, when you come down to receive uh, the ashes, which we're going to do tonight, and I'll go into that a little bit more later, that's part of what we're saying is we're saying it's, there's not much more time left and then I'm back to the dust from which I came. So I'm, I'm going to take tonight to kind of take that a little more seriously and, and put my hands in God's hands to do something out of this dust, to make something out of it. Let's, let's close out the passage here. Um, six and seven, John nine, six and seven, he says, when he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Then he went and he washed and he came back able to see. This is weird. I, I've always thought this passage was weird. Why does Jesus do this? Like if I'm the guy and I, you know, maybe I just heard down the road, he, you know, kind of healed somebody with a word. And then Jesus comes over to me and he's like, all right, I'm going to spit on the ground here and rub it on your eye. <laughs> I'd be like, no, don't do that. Oh, that's, you know, icky. It's, it's odd, right? You know, we don't expect God to work that way, do we? You know, it, we, we just assume if, if God is all-powerful, he's going to heal with a word. It's like, it's just going to happen just like that. And he does that sometimes, you know? The centurion came up to Jesus and said, you know, could you heal my servant? And he says, I, you know, I know, you can just do it with a word. And Jesus does it with a word. Miles and miles away, the guy's healed. But there's other points where he doesn't do that, right? There's the, um, the, the woman with the, the issue, and she, she it's a pun, right? It's an issue. Um, she has an issue. Um, she comes to Jesus, and, and she, uh, and she just, she reaches for the hem of his garment, and she's healed. He doesn't say a word but it's his cloak that does it. And the kind of the funny thing in the passage is Jesus doesn't even know what happened until he, you know, kind of 
it's done already. It's like, oh, that happened. Right? That's weird. And then it gets even weirder when Jesus bends down on the ground and says, I'm going to heal you, but I'm going to do it this way. And uh, I'm going to rub spit in the mud and have you go wash it off. Why? Well, um, I found just a brilliant, super insightful explanation from uh, some early church fathers. When I say that, th those are the, the guys that in the first like five, six centuries of the church um, wrote a lot of kind of like what is the bedrock of what later theologians would build on. And so when, when you read the church fathers, they often can say in like a sentence or a paragraph what, you know, some theologian later on down the road will take a, a whole book to say. It's, it's clear and it's just right there and it's so insightful. And so the way they explain this passage is, is they reveal its symbolic meaning that it's pointing back to Genesis 3, where God creates Adam from the dust, right? That God is the one who is able to bring life into existence from the earth. And so Jesus bends down, and he shows himself to ha have the same power of the God of Genesis 3 in that moment that he reaches down and he makes mud, smears it on the man's eyes, and without even saying a word, he's saying, the God who made Adam is right in front of you right now doing the very same thing. This man has no eyes or the eyes don't work. They're dead, but I can make life out of those eyes. It's, it's weird how God can put things in our lives that kind of, you know, are just kind of these curious symbols, but they're meant to really teach and to change our hearts. I've got a, I've got a symbol I wear every day. It's a wedding ring. I take it off a couple of times throughout the week, and I cannot put this thing back on without thinking about what it means. Impossible. Because it's not just a ring. It's my wedding ring. And I know what I'm saying when I put it on. There, I mean, our life is full of symbols like that. That are, You don't just say, oh, it's just a symbol. It's, it's just symbolic. Like, it, it has power, right? The same power that Jesus has to, like, take mud and, and use that as a conduit of his grace for his healing, right? These symbols are all over, all over the place. I was trying to think of, like, different kinds of symbols, and um, since we're running out of time, I, I just want to uh, point out one that is really impactful to me. A symbolic gesture that speaks of an eternal principle. And so my dad, um, growing up, he was a school teacher, so you know, he would grade his papers at home. Uh, it's my dad's birthday, by the way. Happy birthday, Dad. Um, anyway, um, I, rem I have this memory of him. He's sitting in his chair. He's grading his papers, or he's reading a book, or some he's doing some kind of work. And he had a stack of books on a table next to his chair, um, stacks of papers that needed to be graded, books that he was reading, and the Bible was in there, too. And because he, you know, he'd read the Bible in the same chair. And he took whatever he was working on, it was probably a book he was reading, and he, and he put it down on the stack. And he put it on top of the Bible. And I was probably seven, maybe playing with Legos on the floor or something like that. And, and he said it, not like in a loud like exclamatory way, but just almost to himself. He said, the Bible deserves to be on top. And so he he took the Bible out and put it on top. And I saw him do that. And to my dad, this is just like a symbolic thing. That's like, it, he has reverence for the word. And so that gesture was saying something to himself, reminding himself that this thing goes on top. To this day, I cannot put anything on top of my Bible. It 
goes on top of whatever stack there is. It's always on top. I've even like, I put like my AirPods on top of the bottom. I'm like, nope. And I put them somewhere else. Weird, it's not superstition, right? These symbols aren't superstition. This is like real stuff. It's, it's this external thing, the mud placed on our eyes that is speaking to something that's happening within. That if we participate in it, it has a real effect on us, right? That little thing that he did that one time, he, I don't even know if he remembers that. I don't think I've ever like brought it up, but I cannot shake that memory from my head. And to this day, it, it has formed my view of scripture. Crazy, crazy. It gets crazier. I gave my dad a Bible for his 70th birthday. He's 73 today, but for his 70th birthday, I gave him a Bible. And I kind of wrote a note in it about how much he, you know, taught me about the importance of, of the word and following God. And I gave that to him. And then I, I, was, I was telling my cousin, oh yeah, my dad turned 70. I got him this Bible, sent it to him. And, and my cousin goes, oh, you know, your dad loves the Bible, loves the word. You know, there was this time where I was at your house playing and, and there's this stack of books and he goes and he, he says the same, like, he had my memory. I don't even remember. He was there probably playing with Legos on the floor with me, but it made the same impact on him, right? That blew me away. I was like, dude, that's my memory. And he had it too. And, and to me, this just speaks of the power of just the simple things we do in our lives to reorder and reorientate ourselves towards what's highest and what's most important. My dad, he was just kind of having a little moment of like, nope, I'm gonna reorder things the way they're supposed to be. And he had no idea the impact that would make on his son and then his nephew as adults. Like now they, this is how they see the Bible. And why do I bring that up? How does that all tie together? I. That kind of thing, we see it in the pages of scripture. Jesus does this, he bends down and he, he says something about who he is in, in this symbol, symbolic act of what he does. And then that becomes a vehicle for God's grace to change this man's life. He could have just done it with a word, bypassed all that, but I think Jesus is, is interested in reaching into our lives in a more tangible way sometimes. And so Ash Wednesday, it's, it's another opportunity to participate in something like that. We're going to come down and receive the ashes. And the way, the way this is traditionally done is you get an ash cross placed on your head and, and, and the words are said, you are dust and to dust you shall return. It's affirming the fact um, that well, we can't, well, we're dust without Jesus. We can't do it anything without him. And to dust we shall return. Our lives are short. Time is ticking. I need God. Right? It's this symbol that it could just be a symbol and it could be something that, oh, that was an interesting experience and, you know, maybe I'll show up again next year. Or it can do its work to sink down into your heart and to remind you of what the season is about. It's about looking within and seeing all the brambles that have kind of come in the way of, of being able to see Jesus and start to clear those things back with the help of the Holy Spirit. And so we're, we're going to participate in this little symbolic act tonight. If you want to, you don't have to, but if you'd like to, um, we're going to make two lines. We've got two stations here. There'll be two people down here, whoever's closest to you or available, um, they'll put the ashes on you. It's called the imposition of ashes. Traditionally, it's put on your head, but you know, if you'd rather just have it on your hand or, or something, just put out your hand and, and they'll put it on your hand. Um, and if you're like, well, I'm not ready, but maybe tomorrow with my family or something, we got even portable little ash things that we can send you home with if you'd like to do this with somebody else later. Um, so, um, but we're going to sing a song, and we're going to invite you down. 
And as you come down, as you line up, just be, be thinking about oh, what are those things that the Holy Spirit is shining on my life? What, are the, what is the mud, the blindness in my life that he wants to wipe away? And then with the faith of the blind man to say, okay, I'll give it a shot and run and go wash in the pool of Siloam. Just say, I'm going to step out in faith and engage with the Spirit's work in my life to begin to heal and to bring life where there was death. So um, we'll pray really quick, and then a song is going to start. And as soon as the song starts, you can just start lining up, and our, and our ash folks can, uh, can come up too. So let me pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for just the wonderful and mysterious ways that you step into our life to bring about healing, to restore us. And sometimes the things you put in front of us don't make sense. Um, but God, we just, if it's you speaking to us, we just pray that we recognize your voice, that, that that's the voice that we follow you, and we follow it on faith. God, Holy Spirit, we we ask you to reveal within us the things that you'd you'd like to you'd like to bring your healing touch on. Give us this grace and the strength and the courage to look at those things. Give us the bright sadness that is to acknowledge them for what they are, but to hold on to hope that you're giving us the ability to move past and transcend and be victorious over those things, that you're the one who can do that. We, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your blood that washes away all sin, and it's the power of your blood that makes this mysterious, beautiful process of repentance possible. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. And in your name, amen.